Um, we have the last panel of the day on integrating in, uh, individual and group models of decision making. Decision making. And Dan, take it away. Good title, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, an argument for marketing with it. <laughs> So I hope you can all hear me. We good. Um, so basically, I'm going to go out and put a limb here, and um, but I feel much more comfortable after uh, hearing uh, Norm's talk and Dan Krause's talk. And I'll be speaking specifically about the one question that I, I'm sure was on people's minds before they set out to do a jury study: Should we actually simulate deliberation, or can we do without it? Um, and I'm going to uh, take a position that uh, a qualified position that oftentimes. We're better off doing without it. So, um, two dimensions for evaluating this question. One is validity, and the other is resources. And obviously, resources are the, you know, the, the elephant in the room. Um, and, uh, but I won't speak much about that, because it's kind of obvious. It's really resource heavy. So I'll skip the resource, I'll speak about validity. So the threshold question is, what is the objective of the study? And here I'm actually echoing Noel's point again. And uh, the best I can do as a sort of a mid-career swan is to whack kind of distort the sound. A uh, little my best. Um, so if it's to study the deliberation, things like decision making, persuasion, polling methods, SDS, and, and the like, then the answer is, yeah, it's a no brain. That's what Lord called the da answer, right? That's what you want to study, then go study. Um, and study juries, it's end of discussion, with the caveat, and the caveat being, yeah, but those questions aren't always the most important or most prevalent questions, and part of their sort of limited interest is that sometimes it's very hard to manipulate this going back to system variables. Ideally, we will be doing research that can actually help us change the world. Um, that's okay. um, so, alternatively, if we're actually studying a non-deliberation aspect, this days of thing. Yeah, and no cat would chase this light. Um, <laughs> things like, and there's a whole laundry list and you can multiply this many times over all the stuff that we usually study that's non-deliberation, right? Stereotyping and PTP and system one, system two, processing and blah, blah, blah. All the other good stuff, that's when the dynamic really kicks in. So uh, it's a methodological dilemma, right? basically, um, you've got to think about it in two ways. One is what's the upside? And the upside is basically, forget the term, Steve, ecological validity, right? So the question we'd be asking is, does deliberation appreciably enhance the ecological validity of the study? The second question is, well, might there be a downside? And there again, I'm echoing comments before that there is a trade-off, and we're on the horns, and we're getting poked. <laughs> uh, might deliberation have collateral effects on other aspects of validity, and primarily we should be thinking about construct validity here, but only be making sure too. So let's think about the upside first. Um, basically, ecological validity is usually the holy grail. It's out, and there it is. So where is this from? <laughs> Participation? Python. Monty Python. Good. So there are going to be more Monty Python references. So those of you who know it, kind of rate your memory. Um, so how do we measure? So the question is, how do we measure the effect of deliberation? Well, we do it in different ways depending on if we're looking at field data or lab data. So for field and naturalistic settings, we compare first ballot votes with the final votes, the first ballot votes of the individual jurors with the final verdict of the jury, and we see what happened. And it's a kind of straightforward, intuitive way to do that. It's not without its problems, because there are uh, questions about what transpired prior to the first ballot. And we know from Sherry and others, it can take 20, sometimes 40 minutes until the first ballot. So there could have been movement already, and we won't capture that by this method. So that's the limitation. The second is that there's concern over the validity of the reports that we get. Think of, it's basically a self-report, and it could be, we know from memory research, that kind of coherence effects in memory, we're trying to distort memories in order to make more sense to where we got at the end. Um, and they're just basic issues with, with, with ego maintenance and such. And as Sherry reminded us before, we also might be missing the hung juries in these data here, and we're going to treat them separately. Though I don't think that the number is as high, because I think that the, um, the uh, NCS, the Hung Jury study, the big one, and we, we treat this fairly canonical, I think the 
delivery rate is about 70%, so I think it was 25 out of 300. Um, in lab studies, we do it differently. It's much easier, right? You just ask the subjects what is their leaning or verdict before they go in, and then you see how the group votes at the end and compare the two. So let's look at these data. And I'm taking these from the same paper that Norm mentioned before. Uh, this is 2012, it's table four, and it's the second coding regime, which I think everybody agrees is the right regime, right? You would like people to agree on I think. So we're looking at conviction rates. Here we have three studies from real naturalistic data. Uh, one is Dennis's, the other is Andrew Lee, and then there's the famous Hung Jury study. But if you want to just cut to the chase and go to all studies combined and find a column, and we'll be looking at I'm, this is my arbitrary breakdown of uh, three sizes of factions that favor conviction at the pre-deliberation phase. So if there are between zero and four um, jurors voting for conviction at the first ballot, we'll treat them as one group, and there's a the middle group, and then there's the high group from eight to 12. So if you look at the first group, basically out of 55 real life juries, own that started off with a between zero to four jurors voting for conviction, basically nobody convicted, one out of 55. If you look at the second group, that's the either um, five, six, or seven, that's the little people, you're getting a 68% number. And if you're looking at the high uh, factors for conviction, it's almost 100%. If you look at the lab data, again, conviction rates, the same uh, breakdown of factions, this is again from Dennis's meta-analysis, you get pretty much very similar data. 1% up here, 98% down here, and 26 in the middle. So if you line up the field and the lab data, basically what you're getting is a huge, powerful, robust majority effect. And it kind of blows everything else away. Because here, basically, you're getting between 1 and 2% convicting in this group, and here all but between 2 and 4% convicting in that group, so pretty much it doesn't seem like the liberation is making much of a difference in these two extreme groups. Now, it probably is making a difference here in the middle. We don't know, but it's more likely that it's happening there. But this is a fairly small group. It's just 15% of the juries. And um, secondly, I just point out that we might actually have a methodological problem here. Because we're getting a, quite a substantial difference between the field and the lab, which might mean that the lab studies, this ecological validity that we're investing so much to obtain, actually sucks because it's not actually <laughs> what's happening out there in real life. Now, you guys mentioned maybe the problems with the real life jurors, but that's a normal question. As far as the ability to simulate it in the lab, we've got a problem. So, kind of puts a bit of a damper on this whole idea of simulating jurors. I'll just point out that um, in the death sentencing, Phase. Again, this is real life data taken from uh, Ted's piece. Um, the, the faction is a bit different here. They, apparently, there are high thresholds, but you get the same effect that if between zero and eight people vote for death, close, I mean, basically zero of the juries will actually uh, sentence the person to death. Same thing up here, it's 100%. If it's above 10, nine jurors tend to be the, the tipping point. If I understood the way you did it with the percentages, which is kind of clunky, but doesn't matter. <laughs> Just put the numbers and it'll be easy for you. <laughs> Mine is from 67% to 75% of the jury, which kind of sounds like, oh, that's only mine. Right? Okay. So, the second question is, and kind of looking at the same question, but from a different angle, there are studies that compare performance on specific tasks, not just on verdicts, right? Um, and they compare juries with jurors, and that's sort of another way of getting at this. So a few things that kind of pop out from the literature. One is, groups are most likely to outperform members when the correct outcome is demonstrable. If it's a logic puzzle or a math thing, and someone can actually show what the right answer is, yeah, well, that, it's going to help the group you know, get to the best answer. But that's really the case in the kinds of legal questions we're looking at. Second point is, groups tend to outperform individual members when most of the members, or at least the influential members, are correct. But if those members are incorrect, they can actually screw up the performance of the group. Um, and this is some basic psych, this is not just from jury studies. 
And we do know that so the drill performance varies widely. So you can imagine that sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it actually worsens the performance. And then there's a bunch of studies out there that show that deliberation does not make an appreciable uh, improvement over the performance of individuals. And this is Dennis, where you and I are feel a bit differently. I think you're a bit more upbeat on that literature, and I'm a bit less or so downbeat on it. And may, maybe we're maybe it's me picking the studies, but it's interesting. But, and I'm not saying that it doesn't, it's just that it's not very appreciable. So, um, memory for trial evidence, not much of a help, meaning deliberation doesn't improve uh, during performance. Comprehension of jury instructions, compliance with curative jury instructions, drawing inferences from evidence, that's mixed data. Um, exposure to PTP, again, mixed results. Uh, deceit detection uh, groups don't, deliberation doesn't help. Understanding DNA evidence, not really either. So, so again, it just looks like a massive data suggests that deliberation just doesn't do much good. So to summarize this point of ecological validity, kind of uh, deliberation does not influence verdicts in about 85% of cases, and it doesn't really improve performance of specific tasks much either. So now we want to just discuss the potential downside, and here we come to the trade-off question. Um, when you search for the Holy Grail, you might encounter, who are these? The knights that say, me, me, exactly. And when they're tired of repeating me, they say, I keep the time. <laughs> and you might encounter the deadly rabbits, or you might be thrown onto the death cart even when you're alive. So my point is there are downsides and compromises and trade-offs. So construct validity, the might, the deliberation actually obfuscates the findings that we're trying to obtain about all the other issues, those interesting issues that we want to study. Um, and uh, one thing sort of uh, coming to the conclusion, groups are more volatile than individuals, especially again when the correctness isn't demonstrable. Uh, we've done lots of studies about the repolarization. There's quite a few studies that show confidence inflation that's not correlated to increasing performance uh, from deliberation. But we know that there's lots of ego maintenance issues that come up and could cause groups or at least members to behave in quirky and sort of not particularly uh, you know, accuracy seeking ways. Uh, deliberation is noisy, it's elusive, it's influenced by lots of factors that have nothing to do with the focal hypothesis that we're trying to measure. Things like social dynamics, normative persuasion, that kind of goes all over the map. Uh, members' confidence, members' perceived competence. Members perceive persuasiveness, members race, individual differences. It's a nice work of persuasion resistance that Stephen Reed did quite a while ago, and there's a new construct that I found social vigilantism, which is basically what you guys say. Um, so with all of these things causing all this noise, it's kind of hard to say, oh, if we put it in deliberation, we'll get better outcomes. We'll get kind of noisy outcomes, which means it weakens our ability to actually describe how jurors are performing on these tasks. Uh, and I also want to mention something that's kind of obvious, you're also typically weakening the statistical power because you're reducing 300 jurors to, I don't know, 50 data points. So, in conclusion, deliberation provides only a moderate contribution to ecological validity, if at all. Um, I mentioned no effect, uh, mentioned all that. Deliberation can muddy the findings of the focal variable at the juror level, that's sort of the downside. So not much of an upside and quite likely a downside. Not necessarily makes things worse, it just makes them less clear and makes our ability to draw inferences from our study all the time. Um, and I, we cannot forget that this is a very uh, resource-heavy uh, endeavor. The, uh, and it's important also that the simulation itself has ecological limitations. Just because we're adding deliberation doesn't mean that that deliberation is ecologically valid to simulate a real-life deliberation, right? So it gets us a bit closer, or at least in theory it should. But, you know, people are going to come at you. Oh, you only gave one hour. Huh, our jurors will be for three days. Oh, you only gave six, you give 12. You only, you know, no stakes, and the usual stuff keeps popping up. So at best, we're going to get some marginal a marketing advantage for very little more validity than probably even necessary data. Um, I want to remind you the differences between 
in the middle group, which is sort of, of, of five to seven jurors, right, the factions, the, the middle category. So the labs seem to underestimate or show lower levels of conviction in real life. So we might have a bias built in. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Maybe it's just an artifact. But even if we do the deliberation, we might still be stuck with this discrepancy that, to my knowledge, we don't yet quite understand. And then there's the sad truth that studying deliberation will not persuade the skeptics. <laughs> Rehnquist, had he been alive, would come at us with anything that we present. Rich Wine has got a great series of studies where he keeps going up to the Missouri court with jury instructions, and they say, oh, we prove this ecological validity. He goes back, runs 2,000 subjects, comes back, and they say, oh, but you forgot this aspect. We'll never catch up, because there's always something to you know, trash any kind of simulation. I'll quote the Bradley, it's still a simulation. And I don't think we're actually going to win it over any sort of big way. So that's it. Thank you very much. So the title of my talk is Developing a Model of Jury Decision Making, making Through Integrating Individual and Group Models. So I guess I'm more of the optimistic group that deliberation does have something to tell us uh, of, above and beyond what individual jurors say. Uh, oh, I need the picture. Here we go. Okay. So before we talk about the integrating these two types of models, I first wanted to introduce them. In the literature examining individual jurors' decisions, we started with mathematical models that varied the method of how evidence is weighed and then jurors use that evidence to arise at a, arrive at a verdict. We've already talked a bit about the story model today, which is the mo largely the most accepted model for how individual jurors make decisions. So the focus of my presentation is largely looking at what types of hypotheses we can take from the story model if we apply the story model to the group decision. Most traditional models of, jury, of group jury decision making have used mathematical modeling to predict the outcome of the jury using the initial verdict distribution and the rules required of deliberation. And we've absolutely seen the value of such models in research and there's need for expanding these so that we understand more. Um, however, my goal instead is to integrate these mathematical models for jury decision making with the framework provided by the story variables to develop an explanation-based model at the jury level. So why would we want to account for the deliberation process? And you can see my optimism here in the header, right? Um, first of all, there are several studies that suggest the deliberation process matters. But before we get there, we have to talk about that big, un big underlying assumption that the mathematical models of group decision making make that Sherry spoke about earlier in her comments. Um, the assumption is that jurors begin deliberation with a verdict preference. And we've seen studies that show that this is not always the case. So it's possible that assuming jurors have this preference going into deliberation and then using that mathematical model to predict the outcome is actually based on a flawed premise. It's not actually what is occurring in real life as close as we can get it. Um, other research has shown that deliberation variables do explain variance in the final verdict and it's shown that really those, those deliberation processes can mediate the relationship between initial verdict preferences and final verdict. Yet other research shows that deliberation matters in specific case scenarios too. In two studies, deliberating juries awarded different damage amounts compared to individual jurors. Another study showed that deliberation increased jurors' confidence in a verdict that was in line with a more accurate expert, showing that maybe deliberation helped jurors process that expert testimony better. And yet another study, uh, jurors who deliberated were more likely to ignore inadmissible evidence than other jurors. So collectively, these studies suggest that deliberation variables may actually affect the final jury's decision. So traditional models of jury decision making, again, have focused mainly on these input-output variables, taking into account individual pre-deliberation preferences, or pre-deliberation pre verdict preferences, applying the rules of deliberation, and calculating a final group verdict. But again, this is based on that assumption that everyone has a pre-deliberation verdict, plus research shows us that deliberation can matter. So how do we account for what happens during deliberation? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> social psychological literature on group decision making can help us fill in some of these gaps. We know from observational studies of jury decision making that the content of deliberate, that juries spend much of the time during deliberation discussing evidence and a significant amount of time discussing law as well. We also know that juries will typically deliberate in one of three ways, either a verdict style where jurors first indicate that initial verdict preference 
and then spend time trying to convince other jurors of that verdict preference. Um, an evidence-driven style where they instead start by discussing the various pieces of evidence and agreeing on the content of that evidence before coming to a decision, or a mix of these two styles, maybe where they start in a verdict-driven way and then get sidetracked or something like that. Um, other research has labeled the stages of deliberation, really describing what occurs during deliberation and orientation, open conflict, and then attempting to make sure that everyone is satisfied with that final verdict. Social psychological literature also gives us a plethora of information about how groups make decisions, sometimes in the context of a jury and sometimes not. Several studies have examined minority-majority influence and the conditions under which a minority is more likely to be successful than others. Um, others have examined the kind of influence taking place in groups to explain why people change their minds, either because of normative influence, meaning that people change their minds to go along with the rest of the group but privately maintain their own beliefs, or through informational influence, where they actually both change their private and public beliefs, usually in response to information that they buy from another person in the group. Um, yet other studies have used persuasion. The one cited here is by Jess Salerno and her colleagues. And they looked at how jurors use persuasion, how they use heuristic processing messages, or how they use central messages to persuade each other during that deliberation process. And yet other social psychological research has looked at how the social sharedness of information affects the group's decision. So that is, it looks at the extent to which preferences and opinions are shared among group members and how that impacts the performance of that information, or of the, how the, that impacts how that information affects the group decision. So we know something about those group dynamics that are likely occurring during deliberation. We know something about the types of influence. Basically, the jurors are sharing information and trying to persuade each other with this information. But what information are they sharing? To answer this question, we need to look at what they're bringing into deliberation. And so this naturally invites a discussion of the story model of juror decision making. Because the information jurors are likely sharing is probably the stories and the episodes that they've developed as they've listened to the trial evidence. I won't go into too much of a thorough review of the story model here. Instead, I'm going to go over the basics of how jurors create stories and render verdicts at the individual level to give us an idea of how the story model may translate into the group decision. So the first stage of the story model is story creation, where jurors integrate the evidence into a, sto the evidence into a story or a causal chain of events using the trial evidence, their personal experiences, and their expectations about what makes a story complete to create their final story. But we also know that jurors may create more than one story to account for the evidence of the circumstances described at trial. So we have to ask ourselves, what makes the best story? There are three variables that contribute to a juror's selection of the best story. The first is the story's coverage, or the extent to which it can explain all the evidence presented at trial. If pieces of evidence can't be accounted for by the story, then this story probably won't be deemed the most reliable story. The second variable is the story's coherence, or the consistency, completeness, plausibility of the story. If the story is more consistent and contains all the parts that make up that logical story, if it's plausible, it's likely to be deemed the best story. The last variable is the uniqueness of the story. If multiple stories are generated that are high in both coverage and coherence, then jurors will likely not think that any story is the best story. So we know that coverage, coherence, and uniqueness contribute to the juror's choice in the best story, but how does this translate into verdict? Well, the next step of the story model is the step in which jurors learn the different verdict options available to them at trial. We know that jurors' prior knowledge of the law may interfere with this task. So once they figure out whether the, what they're trying to see if the defendant did, um, they'll learn those verdict options, there they learn those verdict options, and then they map their best story onto the possible verdict definitions. So the best match is then the decision that they make. So you see the circles match. Okay. <laughs> so how might the story model apply to the group decision? Well, um, previous researchers have reported that they've observed jurors using processes similar to those in the story model. And some research could actually be reinterpreted in a way that shows some support that jurors are using the story model during deliberation. In this particular study, Holstein coded jury deliberations, um, and he coded for discussion of what he called schematic interpretations during evidence which he defined as evidence plus jurors' unique knowledge. This sounds an awful lot like stories or episodes that jurors create at the individual level in the story model. 
He said that during deliberations, jurors adapted their schematic interpretations to match other jurors' interpretations. So this sounds a lot like jurors perhaps are revising their episodes in larger stories to create a group story. Okay. In addition, in this study, as the number of schematic interpretations or stories presented increased, so did the probability of a hung story. So this seems to speak to uniqueness a bit, in that as the, as the number of stories increased, the number of plausible stories increased, then the probability of the jurors choosing any one story decreased. However, it's important to acknowledge that this particular study was limited in that it didn't really define the variables they studied in the story model context or use those terms as a theoretical basis. So it's missing the full picture of how the story model really might operate here. It also had a very small sample size and didn't examine the variables again within the context of the group dynamics we discussed, we discussed earlier. So future research could expand in these areas. If the story model applies to the group decision, the explanatory-based group model might reflect some of the same underlying processes in the individual juror's decision. The group might engage in this process of story creation, agreeing on episodes and stories, or creating multiple stories, then discussing verdict options, engaging in verdict mapping together as a group, and then rendering a verdict. Examining how jurors share and are persuaded by stories in deliberation may help us elucidate why and how group dynamic variables affect story creation. For example, the social sharedness of stories or episodes may affect story or group story creation. Using this paradigm, stories could be considered cognitive arguments. The more these cognitive arguments are shared by jury members, the more likely it is they will be adapted into the final story and impact verdict. The lower the social sharedness of stories, the less likely it is they will be adopted by the group. If many good stories are presented, thus compromising again the uniqueness of any story, then no story will be high in social sharedness. Minority, minority and majority influence on the, in the jury could be also studied according to this uh, social, share, the social sharedness of stories or episodes. Factors that we already know about how the jury deliberates may also affect how the story model applies to the group decision. So for example, the deliberation style of the jury may affect what stories get shared. Whether juries even agree upon a final story in deliberation could be affected by this deliberation style. A verdict-driven jury may be less likely to hear stories presented by jurors given that the dynamic of the deliberation seems to be convincing other jurors to adopt a particular decision. So the majority may be more likely to prevail then in an evident, or in a, in a, excuse me, majority may be more likely to prevail in their collective story here. A minority, on the other hand, may be more likely to prevail in an evidence-driven jury because perhaps the majority will be more likely to listen to their stories, um, the stories shared by the minority. Deliberation style could also affect the type of influence used. Normative influence may be more likely in an evidence-driven jury, whereas, or excuse me, normative influence may be more likely in a verdict-driven jury, whereas informational influence may be more likely in an ev evidence-driven jury. In addition, measuring the coverage, coherence, and uniqueness of the stories presented by the jurors could give us some important insights into how the deliberation process results in a verdict. Again, using persuasion and perhaps minority-majority influence processes as theoretical backgrounds in this group context could help us understand how the story variables operate in that larger context as well. Verdict mapping ostensibly occurs in the deliberation context as well. We don't know whether this occurs similarly to individual models. Likely it occurs throughout deliberation as jurors try to make sense of the evidence in the law. Verdict mapping and deliberation may be based on the jurors' common understanding of the law, but again, we don't know whether they're mapping based on the single best story decided by the group or multiple stories embraced by the various jurors. Likely, the type of influence that occurred during deliberation affects whether jurors are mapping a single or multiple stories. But in any case, one thing to keep in mind in applying the story model to the group decision is that this group-based story model should be able to explain what is accounted for already by those mathematical models. So, adding these deliberation variables should increase the accuracy with which we can account for the group's decision above and beyond traditional mathematical models. In addition, there are a few other methodological things to keep in mind, because again, as people have mentioned, deliberation is costly, it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time. And so we want to make sure that if we're doing these studies, first of all, they matter, so they're accounting for variance above and beyond the mathematical models. And then secondly, that we do them correctly or that we do them in a way that's going to best maximize the chances that we're capturing that deliberation process. 
So first, we want to make sure to give jurors adequate time for deliberation. One shortcoming of past studies is that it cuts this process short. If, um, if we do that, we don't give adequate time for the entire deliberation to play out. So we may not be able to fully understand how their story variables may operate in this group context. Second, we need to put thought into how to measure stories in the group context. The way we've done this in our lab so far is very similar to previous work that created story statements with individual jurors, but we've adapted it for a group context. So first, we pilot tested trial stimuli to see what, what's in, what stories individual jurors create in response to our stimulus. Then we created story statements consistent with these various stories based on that data and tested agreement with those story statements um, in a second study. So we found that our story variables or our story statements predict verdict in our second study. So now we're using those same story statements to code for the content of deliberation, what stories jurors are sharing, what they're talking about in deliberation, and then, um, and then how, how that affects final verdict. And then last, again, we need to keep in mind that not all jurors begin deliberation with a clear preference. So we need to uh, allow some deliberation to occur organically without asking jurors about their initial verdict preferences before going into deliberation so that we make sure we're not changing the deliberation process by asking for those prior commitments. So that's all. Thank you. again in the future. I floated that idea already and Margaret said, well, you can go off and submit the proposal. So I walked into that one. Um, definitely, definitely. It's the least I could do. Um, the title's a little bit of a bait and switch here. I was in a kind of a playful mood when I was sitting down to do this. Uh, the, uh, the models actually were very well behaved and very appropriate. <laughs> maybe, maybe just a tad unruly, but certainly they hadn't gone wild. And, no models were harmed in the creation of this talk. You know what you were watching when you thought that. <laughs> okay, so this is what I'd like to cover. And uh, it, it occurred to me that this is an insane amount to, to try to work into one 15-minute talk here. And I'll try to be mindful to, to leave a little bit of time. In fact, I think I should probably start at the end and work backwards. Uh, largely because the first part of the talk, I think, has been covered very nicely. Uh, and some other treatments and some stuff that is available out there. So I'm going to step lively through that part, but I'm going to call attention to a few different models at the juror and jury levels and compare them a little bit in terms of offering some thoughts about them. Um, then I'm going to present a new model, and uh, it actually operates at two levels. That's the, uh, the title about bridging the divide. Um, one of my observations in, in working on the book was that there's a lot of stuff that seems to be going on in parallel, stuff at the individual jury level, stuff at the jury level, and not necessarily a lot of crosstalk between the levels, and that was something I hope that this theory uh, will, will help to correct. So the individual level model is called the Director's Cut Model, and I'll say more why that uh, name was given. And then the jury level model is called the Story Sampling. So they're intended to work together and the two of them make up the, the new theory. And I hope, hope I haven't overstepped anything calling it a theory, uh, because sometimes I think we, we apply that label a little bit too lightly. But I, I hope I haven't uh, made the same mistake. And then the last thing I wanted to do was uh, moving forward, thinking about what are the sorts of things that we should be studying. And I'd like to call attention to the construct of deliberation quality, an inherently jury level sort of construct. And I, I think it's something that. Uh, we could spend more time thinking about, and I can personally feel good about doing research on that because I think that if we have a better understanding of quality, ultimately we'll be able to do things that make for fair and more accurate decisions, and then we don't have to get into situations where, like early on, I made the comment about Christina's research where I, I was concerned that it'd be used in a partisan fashion. Well, if we can, if we can all agree that we want juries to deliberate well, regardless of what that particular outcome might be. That seems to me a, a place for us to focus our research, so I wanted to say a little bit about that. And uh, I, I wanted to identify a few components of quality and some things that I think the research suggests might uh, influence it. So hopefully I can do all that. 
So I wanted to identify a few ways in which uh, juror and jury models may differ. I think that this is a selected list. You could certainly come up with some other things. But one of the things we, we've certainly uh, talked about today is how juror and jury models can differ, that, that level of analysis. That's been very salient. Uh, but there's some other ways as well. Uh, a lot of the times we're interested in explaining what verdict or what award to a lesser extent in the literature, uh, jurors and juries come up with, but we could also focus on some process aspects of their deliberation. Typically, we're not so much concerned with the cognitive process of an individual, but certainly the interactive processes of uh, an interacting jury could be the focus of study. Uh, most of our models seem like they're descriptive in that they're intended to explain or describe the way juries actually do things. But we could take the tack that we could come up with, here's a way to do something. Uh, here's how it ought to be done. This is something we ought to be striving for. So that's what I call prescriptive there. Uh, foundational unit refers to sort of what's the, uh, what's the lowest level unit of the different theories. And I could come up with at least three different ones. Uh, individual cues, and a lot of times we're talking about the evidence. Uh, we we want to parse the evidence up into cues or little pieces of it. Um, so some of the models use cues. Uh, one of the models, the story model, uses the, the idea of a story. And a lot of the group level models use the distribution of verdict preferences, often at the start of deliberation, but then some of them also are concerned with that distribution over the course of deliberation. And then the last thing with regard to the models is that uh, this issue of time, some of the models, uh, when you get into the nuts and bolts, they, they postulate something happening and then uh, there's some impact of that, and then there's another cycle. So they're like one cycle versus multi-cycle. And there, again, there are some other ways, I think, that, that models differ, but these are some of the ones that, in, in thinking about uh, the models that are out there, that, that occur to me. I should probably also add that uh, what I'm about to say over the next couple of slides is drawn largely from one of the chapters of the book that, that folks have been very kind to mention. Um, and then the last part of the, of the talk with regard to the new theory. That's another chapter. So this really comes from two of the chapters of the book. Right. So a quick word about juror level models. Uh, I think that it, it seems like a lot of reviewers or commentators have drawn the distinction between mathematical approaches and then the story approach. And uh, that seems to uh, fit pretty well as far as I'm concerned. There are some different ways for uh, models to account for juror thought processes and uh, the mathematical approaches are all uh, united in the idea that not necessarily the jurors do this in their head, but that those models can capture it with a, with a formal, relatively parsimonious uh, mathematical representation. So the Bayesian model, uh, we've got people, uh, jurors, taking a priori beliefs about something and then multiplying a likelihood ratio that represents the diagnostic value of new evidence, and then that has implications for how they should feel about the evidence after they've combined the old and the new. And uh, the linear models are very common within psychology, and they've certainly been used here in the jury domain. And, and typically there we're talking about jurors weighting pieces of the evidence, weighting them by their diagnostic or probative value, and then combining them together. And they've got this little idea of a meter, and you know, with different verdicts, and at a certain point, you know, the meter gets close enough uh, to one of the verdict options that the juror says, okay, I'm done, that, that's what I think the appropriate verdict is. Uh, and then there are some stochastic models that I, th I, I find them to be a little bit more complex, but the thing that really jumps out to me about stochastic models is that they, they seem to be honest, very honest, and upfront about the fact that we often can say a jury starts in this state and these are the possible states that it might end up in, and we don't know exactly how it gets from one, from that starting initial state to one of the end states, but it could go like this or it could go like this, and um, therefore it's, it's probabilistic. And one of the reasons that jurors might come to different conclusions about the evidence can be explained nicely by the stochastic approach because some of them might stop processing the evidence earlier than others. So I, I like that feature of the stochastic models. Um, so those are the mathematical approaches. The story model has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, I think in a nutshell, it basically amounts to uh, making narratives out of the evidence, creating stories. Uh, 
when I stop and think about it, it's kind of surprising to me that it's such an elegant and uh, intuitive model that I wonder why we didn't find it before because it seems like we often, we have scripts and schemas and we use them essentially to make sense of what's going on around us. And jurors who are in an unfamiliar situation, it's only natural that they're going to rely on the scripts and schemas and mental representations that they have developed over the course of their lives to make sense of the trial. So it's a wonder it took as long as it did, um, but it's a, it's a pretty neat model, and as, as um, Laura mentioned, it, it appears to sort of be the go-to model now at the individual level. Uh, there, there are some other models that I want to mention as well, and I also want to put a blanket apology. I just decided to leave all the citations out rather than put a few in and then risk offending folks, but if you do want to see yourself cited or uh, the, the full references, that, I'll put that one little plug in for the book, they are there. Uh, so, um, so some of Neil's work on different types of bias I think is definitely relevant and important here. A lot of times when I'm reviewing stuff, uh, it, it seems like uh, if there is something other than the story model that is used as a framework, a lot of times it's these uh, dual process theories of persuasion, collaboration, likelihood. So that seems like it, it gets used a lot. It's not exactly a, a theory of juror decision making, but it seems relevant. And Finkel's work on common sense justice and how jurors uh, and their idiosyncratic interpretations of, of certain legal concepts, how that can play a role as well. It helps explain why we can give them instructions and some of them don't necessarily have any impact, like when we find insanity. Am I really down to five? Is that what you just don't say? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, in that case, I'm not going to say too much about the jury level models. I'm going as fast as I can here. Um, other than to say that the verdict, pref the preference distribution of verdicts seems to be the core here for all of these models. James Davis's work in 1973 was sort of the, uh, the initial framework, and then there have been a lot of nice extensions since then. Some of Norb's work adding in time. Um, uh, Stacer and Davis's work adding an individual certainty so they prefer a verdict, but also they can be very certain and not so certain. And then there's some really neat um, models that have been formalized in computer software, and uh, I would like to see some more work done with those. It seems like they were uh, read some of the, uh, the, the dice and the, the just or juice, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that model I think uh, was really pretty neat. And, um, there's, anyway, there's, um, there's a number of good models. You should check them out if you're not familiar with them, and there are other treatments that have handled this um, better than I have. Um, but what I'm going to do now, and I should also mention, Val, your, your recent model that I, I, I just saw not too long ago, which I thought was really pretty neat and moves us in a, a good direction, which is how civil juries come up with numbers when they reach their uh, decisions about awards. So models have gotten bigger. They've gotten more complex. Uh, they have tended to focus on verdict-related outcomes. It seems like at the individual level we have a choice of buying into one of the mathematical models or we can go with the story model. And at the jury level, it seems like the starting point is that distribution of verdict preferences. And um, what, I, what I tried to do in the book was review a large literature, extract what we know, and put those pieces together, and where they didn't fit real nicely then, try to add something of my own to kind of explain how they go together. Should also add that at the, at the jury level, I don't think there's been a lot of recognition of individual differences. And um, some of the models have them, but I think that would be something that would, would help um, flesh out those models as well. So I skipped it. I'm sorry, I skipped over that one. That's the one I just summarized there. And that's the quick summary. So let me go to the current state of models here. There's a lot of them out there to choose from. Uh, the story model seems fairly well accepted, even though there's not a whole lot of research on it. I mean, we're talking about maybe five to ten good studies that you can look at and say, that really shows some support for that model. But it's so elegant and so intuitive and appealing that a lot of researchers seem like they like it, and that's sort of their model of choice. Uh, but also the models seem like they're aimed at fairly straightforward circumstances in terms of um, two verdict options, one chart, particularly the laboratory work on this. And the real world is messier than that, and that's something I think also we could attend to a little bit more in, in future research. So here's the director's cut model. So this is the individual level model. The central premise here is uh, that jurors are kind of like movie directors, and a lot of movie directors shoot a lot of footage, 
And then later on, they go back and they move it around and they drop some stuff, so some stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. But they fashion it into something that hopefully makes sense to them. And I distinguish the director's cut from the studio version because the studio forces them to get it out on time and may not be what they really think is the best telling of their movie. Um, so here I want to emphasize this is what the juror really does think, organizing the footage into a coherent narrative. So the director's cut model, in a nutshell, boils down to, I think, an extension of the story model, and in particular, an effort to try to identify where these stories come from. We know a little bit more than 25 years ago in terms of what variables have an impact on juror, jurors and how that might tie into the formulation of stories. So these were some of the major points, and now I, I wanted to show you what, what the model actually looks like here. And uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to go through everything. So uh, let me just say very quickly that the stuff on the left, those are variables that I think the literature shows do have some impact on jurors. And I would argue that they have that impact by affecting the initial mental representations that jurors have. And for, I'm not sure exactly that, that all jurors have this, well, I'm, I'm fairly certain they're not every juror has the same kind of mental representation when they start. But certainly before we get into the evidence, they've already formed some understanding of the trial. And that's influenced by the demographic characteristics, case characteristics, and even how well the, the two parties lay out the story in their opening remarks. So those things converge on that pretrial culpability, responsibility, that's the initial mental representation. Then above and below that box, are boxes that are characteristics of the prosecution's evidence and the defense's evidence. And the idea is that the, the P side, the prosecution or the plaintiff, will, will essentially lay out a story. And that will be tested using cognitive mechanisms that have value in everyday life, in particular the idea of a mental model. And a lot of mental models seem like they draw on visual modalities. So sometimes the jurors say, I can picture that, or I can't picture that. I think that there's some meaning there. So I think that's one of the primary mechanisms that jurors use to test the different stories. And at the end of deliberation, they might be a believer in the, the P story, the prosecution of the plaintiff, or they might favor a D story, and I offer a taxonomy of different D stories that they might buy into. They might be trying to decide between multiple stories, or uh, they might uh, not be able to really put it together into any story at all. So I argue that there's four different cognitive states. Here are the highlights of the story sampling model. I'm at zero, so I'm going to just talk even faster and try and get through as quickly as I can. And uh, here, I'm just going to say that I think the central premise of the story sampling model is that stories have importance at the jury level. And that's something I think that uh, most models right now don't necessarily take into account. So that was really where the story sampling model came from. The process of deliberation is uh, an information sampling process. This ties back to the work of uh, Gary Stacer. And deliberation brings out ideas that relate to stories. Some of them are very low level sorts of things, isolated statements or I think this, but not necessarily laying out the premises behind that, all the way up to a juror laying out a full story. I think you know he did this, and then he went there, and I think it was probably because of this. And, and I think if jurors really elo eloquently lay that out, that that might be one of those things that can help us understand when the majority doesn't win and when deliberation actually does matter. So that might be a key event. Uh, I do some stuff with regard to factions. I think a lot of times we treated factions too simply. It's just how many are in them. So I came up with this idea of faction power to try to uh, explain when factions are going to have more impact than others. Here's what the, the picture looks like, and I didn't want to just throw this at you without saying anything at all, but the big pyramid there in the middle represents the content of deliberation, and there's some different kinds of things that jurors can say. The deliberation style that emerges, I wouldn't say it's chosen, but that emerges through the juries in the first few minutes has some impact on what kinds of things are shared, and then the characteristics of the jurors do as well, whether they're extroverted, what their gender is, uh, what their status is. Not all jurors will participate uh, equally, and I think that's something we need to try to explain and account for. So then we can get informational influence from the content, we can get normative influ influence from the faction, and the, the faction power is the construct that, that I came up with to try to explain 
uh, how even large factions may not always be influential if they don't have a good spokesperson in particular. And if they all agree on the same verdict, but they disagree on the underlying story, that may weaken the faction's power as well. And then I also wanted to try to represent the fact that jurors' final stories that largely come from the informational influence might not necessarily uh, correspond well with their, their public uh, verdict preference. Their final when they do the vote, you know, he's guilty or he's not guilty. We know that some jurors are just going to cave in, and that's something I think we should get better understanding of how often that happens. So some new directions. I've already explained a little bit about deliberation quality, but I think this is something that we ought to be taking a look at. And um, I, I think even though it might be difficult to say in any particular instance what is the correct verdict, I subscribe to the assumption that if juries do deliberate well, operate well as a group, we're more likely to get a verdict that we would agree is just and appropriate, or at least consistent with the evidence, than if they don't deliberate well. So that's why I think this is something that is worth paying attention to. And what I did here is try to identify what I think makes for a, a good deliberation uh, when they discuss their instructions. They all assume they know, but the, the research shows they don't often understand very well, so they ought to discuss it. A thorough review of the evidence seems like that is really critical. I think they should probably consider alternative stories, uh, particularly if we're trying to give the defendant the benefit of the doubt. And we want a good working climate. We would like them to not be um, not to cave in, not to be unduly influenced by what other people think in terms of uh, peer pressure. And some of the things that may cause it are down at the bottom, how well they actually do understand the deliberation style they use. Um, we, ideally, I think we'd like most of the juries to talk, but the research shows that you know, maybe up to a quarter of the jurors won't do that. Uh, a diverse Representation in terms of demographics appears to be a good thing. Sam Summers' work shows that. And there's some evidence that complex trials probably result in a lower quality deliberation as well. So I think if we can study these things and identify them, then ultimately one, one way our research may have some impact is to try to formulate these into an instruction that juries are given. Right now, judges typically don't say very much about how juries ought to participate, not how they, how, how they should deliberate. And I know the judges are reluctant to do that, but if, if some research suggests, and it shows pretty directly, that juries will deliberate better with an instruction that, that draws on the research, maybe they'll be willing to do that. I'm actually working on a judge in Indianapolis trying to get him to do that down the road. He's resistant, but I have hopes that later on, eventually, he'll let me test something if I can, if I can show him that it works. So some conclusions. I think we've come a long way. Um, we've got the two different levels. Stories I think are important, and sampling of stories and sharing of those at the jury level I think is important. And then at the bottom there, those are some of the things I think we ought to be spending our time researching. And some of them I've already mentioned, but different kinds of cases I think are, are important for us to study as well. Murder cases and sexual assault cases may be overrepresented a little bit, but if you buy into the notion that we have scripts and schemas and some of these are case related, then we really need to systematically sample different kinds of cases, and we, we might need theories that uh, are customized to different kinds of cases, and, and hopefully something about deliberation quality. So uh, I, I apologize for going over. Uh, I, I went as quickly as I could, but definitely, if I've confused you, please give me a chance to help clarify uh, in, a, in a discussion, either tonight or tomorrow, or contact me, and uh, thank you.